praise him we've come to praise him we've come to praise him and lift his holy name we've come to praise him we've come to praise him we've come to praise him and lift his holy name make a joyful noise unto the lord make a joyful noise unto the lord you are to pray You want to praise Him. You want to praise Him. You want to praise Him and lift His holy name. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Good morning, Fountain of Life. How is everybody this morning? Did you come with the praise on your lip? Well, I just want them to go back into that again, and I want y'all to act like it. I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to praise Him and lift His holy Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord while I have a chance. I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to praise Him, I'm going to praise Him and lift His holy name. As you know, today is our first Sunday and it's Mission Sunday. There was coffee and donuts out there, and uh, if you left something out there for monetary, that will go to our missionaries that we support. After service, we'll have a couple ushers at the doors as you're leaving. If you want to give uh, in that offering, all that after service money goes toward our uh, missionaries, and it all will be sent to them uh, this week. But today is also a special day because it's our Super Sunday, and we have our uh, guests with us today. Daryl and Monica Buttram, they pastor 10th Avenue Church of God in Huntington. We have uh, known each other for many, many years now, and 
We've worked a lot of youth camps together, and you got to watch his wife. She's mean. She, she does mean stuff. Just I, I'll tell you. you, she'll push you down the slide. And get, you're the victim. See, she's going to try to play the victim card now. She would think I would put. How many things that I would push her down a water slide? There's a lot of hands went up right there. You might win this war. But, no, it is so good to have Daryl and Monica with us. Uh, I'm sure she is tired. Uh, she has been gone to Uganda for the last several days and, uh, and been there. And, uh, but we are so thankful to have them here. They are precious to us. And uh, we've actually not talked in a while. So uh, we've kind of we've texted and things like that. But we've not seen each other in a little while. But it is so good to see them and have them here. And Daryl will be up here in just a moment to bring the word, and it's, can we give the Buttrams a, a hand clap this morning? Also, we have a busy week this week, uh, as well, I think we say that every week, but we do have a busy week. Uh, tomorrow, there is no Monday morning with Mick. We are going to do our, our first uh, Monday meals. Um, if you have any shut-ins, please, uh, before you leave, Make sure you let Belinda or Lori know, and we'll, uh, if you've got some shut-ins that live near you, we'd love for you to come pick up some food tomorrow and take that to them. Uh, but we are going to be taking some meals out to the homeless. We're going to be, uh, we've advertised for people to come and dine in and eat, uh, but we're hoping to uh, get that up and launched. You know, a lot of people said, how many dinners are we going to do tomorrow? I have no idea, but we'll kind of get a, a, a scale of that tomorrow once we start. But tomorrow... Uh, Men Ellis will be here a little bit early to, to get stuff rolling, and, and then we're going to serve from 11 to 1. Uh, hopefully tomorrow, with what we're serving, it's not going to be a big, a whole lot of cleanup, so it uh, should be an easy day tomorrow. And then don't forget, Tuesday, uh, prayer. The church will be open from 10 a.m. all the way up until 8 uh, p.m. There's a group that will be here at 10 to pray, a group that will be here at 6 to pray, but the doors are open all day for anybody to come and pray. Amen. Wednesday, we continue our series in authority. We'll have our Bible study at 630. And then also Tuesday night, men, we're uh, going to uh, continue on with our small group uh, in the fellowship hall at 630 on Tuesday. Has ladies got anything going on this week? Ladies are idle this week, so uh, that, that'll that kind of cap us off for the week. But again, it is so good to see you all. Is this not beautiful? I love looking up here and seeing these kids and... Got those hands raised and just worshiping, and it's just a beautiful sight. But uh, how many's ready to give this morning? Again, a, f- a few of you's clapping. I like it. We can have our ushers. We're going to go to the Lord in our giving, and then we're going to turn this praise team loose, and then Pastor Darrell will be up here in just a few moments to, to give us a word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you again for this day. We're, we're so thankful and grateful to be with like-minded people today. We're thankful for the Buttrams. We're thankful for the, the torch that they are carrying in Cabell County and what they're doing there, Lord. We're thankful for, for the, 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 the impact that their families had in their community. But, God, we're thankful that they're here today, and we're thankful that he's got a word that he's going to speak directly over us this morning for this house. But, God, I'm thankful for these people. And, Lord, again, we're just like-minded. We're here today to see your Shekinah glory fall into this place. So, Lord, today, let your presence overwhelm us. God, every circumstance, every situation that we've brought into this room, God, right now, we speak Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus over our circumstances, our situations, and we speak peace that peace that surpasses all understanding. So God, today, in the midst of our chaos, you are our peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You are good, you are good when there's no closes in you are hope 
will see no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus come on sing out that name my heart will sing no This morning, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we want you to pour your spirit out on your sons and daughters this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You've been down long enough. No more walking in shame. Because the way that he loves you isn't something you can change. You've been running in circles, but you can't hide from grace. Cause the way that he loves you isn't something you can't change. Just like Lazarus, out of that grave, our God rewrites his story. Jesus, you change everything when you pour your spirit out. Just like silence. Singing with Paul, praise can break down prison walls. Jesus, you can have it all. Will you pour your spirit out? Pour your spirit out. Don't you pour your spirit out? You can rest in his presence. You can trust in his name. Cause his burden is easy and he's perfect in his ways you can run to the father there's no reason to wait cause his arms have been open and that's not something you can change just like Lazarus out of that grave our God rewrites his story Jesus, you change everything when you pour your spirit out. Just like silence, singing with Paul, please can break down prison walls. Jesus, you can have it all. Won't you pour your spirit out? Just like Lazarus, out of that grave, our God rewrites his story. Jesus, you change everything. When you pour your spirit out, just like silence, singing with Paul, praise can break down prison walls. Jesus, you can have it all. Won't you pour your spirit out? Pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out. 
it is that you are in need of. He is what you need. He is all you need. He is able this morning to meet your need right where you are. There's no such thing as hopelessness in the presence of the Lord. There's no such thing as powerlessness in the presence of the Lord. There's no such thing as all the distractions when you get into the presence of the Lord because he breaks through. And when God breaks through, You don't have anything else to worry about, amen? Will you just raise your hands right now and glorify the Lord? God, thank you for all that you are. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're getting ready to do. God, we glorify your name. We praise you and we lift up all that we are to you and we lay ourselves down at your feet asking you, Lord God, to be exalted in our lives, asking you, Lord God, to be glorified in all that we are because of who you are. We, Lord God, can face today and tomorrow and every day that will come knowing, Lord, that you are all that we have need of. Lord, you are the great I am. And, Lord, we love you, we worship you, and we praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now. And we ask that, Lord, every single need in this place will be met in you. Those things that are bigger than we are, those things that are just a small thorn in the flesh, every single thing, God, that we're dealing with, we ask you, Lord God, to take care of it right now because you are the great I am. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, God. We magnify you. Now, Lord, speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm going to read one verse of Scripture while you're standing, and then I'll let you be seated, all right? I'm going to read to you from 2 Chronicles chapter 20, one verse of Scripture, verse 12. 2 Chronicles chapter 12. O our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Our eyes are on you. When all else fails, keep your eyes on him. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for what you're getting ready to do in this place even now. And we thank you for what you've already done. Now, Lord God, speak to us, we pray, and we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. When all else fails, keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on him. I want you to look at what it was that King Jehoshaphat was saying in this prayer. This is the last part of his prayer that he's praying for the people of Judah. I want you to see what it is that he says. He, he said, our God, will you not judge them? He's talking about three different nations that are under the leadership of Syria, or at least they are in, in tangent with Syria. And as a result of what's going on, they are coming up against them. They've also brought other armies with them. So not just these three particular groups of people, these three nations that have lashed out against Judah, but you have others as well. Judah is basically outnumbered. If you were to go back to chapter 18, you'd find out why. In chapter 18, Jehoshaphat had gone to meet with a relative who was the king of Israel in Samaria. And when he had gone to meet with King Ahab, Ahab had convinced him to go to battle with him against the king of Syria. And so as they had gone out to battle, before they ever did, they received a word from the Lord that this was going to be Ahab's last hurrah, that he was going to die in this battle. And Ahab thought he could pull one over by, on top of God. You know, he was going to get by and do his own thing. And so he decided he was going to dress in a disguise and let King Jehoshaphat go out in King Jehoshaphat's chariot, dressed in King Jehoshaphat's robes. And as a result, they come after Jehoshaphat, not after Ahab. And that's exactly what happened. The king of Syria told all of his people, I don't want you to mess with anybody else. I want you to focus in on killing the king of Israel, the king of the northern kingdom, the king of Samaria. I want you to kill King Ahab. And so when the armies came out and they saw Jehoshaphat's chariot and they came up to try and surround his chariot, even before they realized it was Jehoshaphat and not Ahab, Jehoshaphat cried out to God and God heard him. And when God heard him, he caused for all of the enemies to depart. They decided this isn't King Ahab. This is not who we want. They began to go into another direction. Jehoshaphat was fine, but one of the archers just aimed at random, launched an arrow, and it just happened to get right in between the armor of some guy standing out in disguise who just happened to be King Ahab. King Ahab realized that he was in trouble. He went to his chariot. He stayed in his chariot watching as the battle raged on, bleeding out, watching as the troops of Israel and the troops of Judah began to fight against the people of Syria. It tells us both in chapter 18 as well as when you go back into uh, 1 Kings chapter 22, it tells us that in this particular battle, the battle got intensified. The, it tells us that the people of Syria were just wiping everybody out until finally King Ahab died and everyone decided it's over, it's time to retreat. Now, here's what's happened between chapter 18 of Second Chronicles and chapter 20. Jehoshaphat has made his way back to Judah 
and his army is not as strong as it used to be. Not only that, but you know how that it is when your team doesn't win the big game and they go up against an even harder team than what they were just facing, and now they're already discouraged and they can't seem to get enough morale to move forward. That's where Judah was in this moment. Because they are now down on their luck. Jehoshaphat, he's gone and he's done some great things in Judah. He has established judges. They are ruling in a great way. He's even commanded them to be courageous in everything that they do. But he also knows that if an enemy rises, they're in trouble. Chapter 20 begins with the enemy arising. It's entirely possible that the king of Syria may have even instigated what was going on in retaliation for Jehoshaphat even daring to take sides with King Ahab. You find in the previous chapter, in chapter 19, a prophet actually stands up against Jehoshaphat and says, you're going to have problems because you went out with the enemy of God. He said, but that's not all. You've done a lot of really great things, and so God's keeping tabs on what you're doing. He's aware of where you are. He knows what you're going through as well. Chapter 20, the enemy begins to come. They begin to gather around, and it tells us something very interesting. In verse 3, it says, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. He, he feared. He was afraid. Now, there's a level of fear because he's afraid of the enemy. But there's an even greater fear here because he received a word from God that said, Because you went out with the enemy of God, now God is going to allow for some things to happen that's not all going to be great stuff. How many of you know there's always consequences for every decision that we make? So Jehoshaphat feared, but notice what it says next. It says he set himself to seek the Lord. This word seek, it's used all throughout the Old Testament. This particular Hebrew word, it carries the connotation of wanting an answer, wanting direction. How many of you want direction for your lives? You want direction. You want to know what is it that I need to do? Where is it I need to go? What is it I need to say? What do I need to learn? And here in this moment, it says Jehoshaphat, he set himself to seek the Lord. Now, it's used this way only one other time in, in Scripture, talking about seeking the Lord in this manner, because it combines an aspect and an element of not just wanting the answers, but also recognizing that you know the person who has the answer. And you're going to glorify him because he has the answer. So here in this connotation, it is letting us know that there's an act of worship even as he's seeking the Lord. How many of you have ever felt like the Lord was a thousand miles away? Now you know that he's right there with you. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you always even to the end. But sometimes your feelings don't match up with what you know in your head. Jehoshaphat set himself to seek the Lord. He incorporated aspects of prayer and worship as he went after the Lord, wanting to know what God's direction was, wanting to know what God's intent was. He began to bring worship into the mix. He proclaims a fast throughout the land. Can I tell you that when you don't know what to do, when you don't know where you're going to go, you don't know how you're going to make it, when you seek the Lord, when you incorporate worship into your seeking, you're not just asking him, but you're worshiping him because you already know that he's got the answer. Things are eventually going to change. I don't know how long it will take. Jehoshaphat didn't know how long it would take. He called a fast throughout all the people of Judah. And remember what Judah means? They're the people of praise, the people that praise God. And so the people that are the praising people now become the fasting people. How many of you love to fast? The entire nation fasted. Not just the men. Their wives fasted. Their children fasted. Right down to the nursing babies, they all fasted because they were desperate. They knew they were outnumbered. Jehoshaphat knew he had made a mistake by going and allying himself with Ahab. He knew that there were consequences for the decisions that he had made, but yet he came to this place where he had everyone seeking God. Can I tell you, it doesn't matter what kind of mistakes you made yesterday. 
All that matters is, are you going to seek the Lord today? Jehoshaphat set himself to seek the Lord. All the people began to fast. They all began to chase after God together. And as he begins to pray, he begins to remind God of a lot of his promises. He reminds God of his promise to Abraham. He reminds God of the promise that they had with even coming into the land of Abraham. And then you get down to verse 8. And he said, here we are, the descendants of Abraham. We dwell in the land, and we built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and we will cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and you will save. What he's doing is he's going back to Second Chronicles 7 as well as Second Chronicles 6, and he's remembering how Solomon had prayed at the dedication of the temple, and he's remembering what God had promised, that he was going to hear every single prayer that was going to be prayed. Even if they couldn't get to the temple, all they had to do was face the temple and pray, and God promised he would hear their prayer. And so here you have Jehoshaphat reminding God of his promises. Can I tell you something? God never forgets his promises, but he loves to hear it when you remind him. Kind of like that, that kid who wants something special for Christmas. And not only do they go to Santa and tell Santa what they want, but they come to mom and dad and they tell mom and dad what they want. And mom and dad say, you know, we'll see what we can do. And that kid keeps on telling them over and over again, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want. Red Ryder BB gun, right? And when it finally comes to Christmas morning, there it is. But it, the parents already knew what they were getting that kid. But the kid kept on reminding again and again and again. I think God takes delight in his children coming and reminding him again and again, not because he ever forgot, but because in the process of us reminding him, we're actually remembering ourselves what God has promised. So the reminder is there, and after he's prayed this reminder he continues on until we come to the verse that we read there in verse 12. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? He's outnumbered. He said, these are the people that you wouldn't even let us wipe out. Some of these, they're distant relatives of Israel, and you would not let us wipe them out when we came into the land. Here we are, and now they are repaying us for our goodness toward them by siding with Syria and coming to destroy us. Will you not judge them? Can I tell you something? God is going to judge, which is why you and I don't have to. There are a lot of things going on in this world that we could talk about all day long, but I'm telling you, God's going to judge. We're not the judge, and the last time I checked the scripture, judgment always begins in the house of God anyway. So we need to let God be the judge, and we just need to focus in on the task at hand. So here you have Jehoshaphat asking, will you not judge them? And then he says, we have no power. Now, again, he's referencing the fact that they've lost a lot of their troops when they had allied with Ahab. But there's another dimension to this that I'm sure you all understand. He's come to the realization that in himself, he cannot win the victory. Have you ever felt like your victory just disappeared? Struggling with something, maybe a temptation. Several years ago, I was out when Mercy Revival was going on here in Boone County, and uh, we had this thing out at the park. Some of you may remember that. We all came together, and it was just an all day long. It was so hot. I was, like, dripping with sweat before I ever got up. But all these people that came together who were in, in recovery, and they just saturated that park with this desire for God to intervene, for God to break through, for God to do something absolutely phenomenal because they realized in their struggle with addiction that they could not overcome it on their own. And there were churches from all over Boone County and maybe some other counties that even had come together for that event because there was this understanding Everybody keeps on trying to do it in themselves, and they keep failing. But when we come to this place where we're not just looking for a higher power, but we're looking to the higher power, God shows up, and God does something absolutely incredible. And all the testimonies that came out of Mercy Revival all those years ago, 
of people whose lives were changed and transformed. And some of those people are in ministry today because they realized that they were powerless in and of themselves. But when they looked to God, they found all the power they needed. We are powerless. How many of you feel sometimes like you're, you're powerless? Your situations, your circumstances, they've arisen against you. They, they have entrapped you. And you feel like you can't even move forward, like you don't even have enough strength to move your feet. That's where Jehoshaphat was. We have no power against this multitude that is coming against us. But then, of course, this next part, we do not know what to do. I've been around a lot of people that want to tell me what to do. I'm not looking at you, Monica, my wife, you know. I've met a lot of people that want to tell me what to do and even want to tell me how to do it. I cannot tell you the number of conferences I've been to, uh, the number of teachings I've listened to, podcasts I've listened to, to tell me how to be a greater minister, how to be a greater pastor, how to pastor the largest church in the world, which I don't pastor. All these people want to tell me what to do and how to do it. And I'm grateful that they have some expertise. I'm grateful that they have some understanding and that they have some education in these matters. I'm grateful that maybe they can even share some insights that will be helpful. But at the end of the day, if I don't know what God wants me to do, then it doesn't matter what I know. In your own life, there are going to be times, even this week, where you might not know what to do. But I want to suggest to you, God already knows what you're up against. He already knows what you're going to be up against. He's already prepared a way. He's already provided a way. He is the way. He will see you through. All you've got to do is what Jehoshaphat ended up doing. I'm powerless, and I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. God is good, amen? All the time, we can look at him, the goodness of God, the greatness of God. We can keep our eyes on him. We can, we can absolutely depend on him, even when it doesn't seem like it, even when it still feels like he's a thousand miles away. We can still count on him to keep his word because he never, ever lies. So if you'll keep your eyes on him, no matter what's going on, he will definitely see you through. And so as you continue to read on down in the passage, it tells you that the spirit of the Lord came upon a young man by the name of Jehaziel. Jehaziel is one of the priests. He's one of the Levites. This is the only place in all of scripture that you see Jehaziel mentioned. He's not mentioned anywhere else in scripture. This is a one and done prophet. And yet that one and done prophet ended up receiving something incredible from the Lord. The Lord told everybody, you don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. Listen to this. The spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph. So he's supposed to be sons of Asaph. They're praise and worship leaders. In the midst of the assembly, the word comes on him, and he said, Listen, all you Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. Jehaziel receives this word, and it inspires all the nation of Judah. Jehoshaphat is so excited when he receives the completion of the word. The Lord even gave them marching instructions, told them where the enemy was going to be, where they needed to go to position themselves so they could stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. When Jehoshaphat receives all this, the king bows down on the ground and everybody else begins to bow down and they just begin to worship God because they knew that it was God that had spoken. The next morning when they get up and it comes time for the battle, Jehoshaphat rallies everybody together, and this is what he says. He says, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Now, I'm not talking about blab it and grab it, name it and claim it, tag it and snag it. 
When I talk about prosperity, that, that, that's not it. What I'm talking about is I want to prosper as my soul prospers. I, I'm talking about a prosperity that goes beyond the riches of Bill Gates and, and Soros and uh, all these other people that are trying to influence the world. I'm talking about the kind of prosperity where I am so full of the Holy Ghost that nothing else in this world even matters. Now, along the way, if he wants to give me a couple million dollars, that's fine, too. When your eyes are on God, you can know that he's going to establish you. He's going to build you up strong. And when you're receiving the word of God and taking it to heart and allowing it to sink in and living according to what God has said. Then you know that whatever steps you're taking are prosperous in the eyes of God. So Jehoshaphat does the next thing. He calls all the worship leaders together. And he even gives them the song to sing. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you all to go out there. I want you to sing this song about how that the mercy of the Lord endures forever. So go on out. And as you're going, the priests are up in the front. The singing priests are out in the front. The singers. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm in battle, I want to be quiet. No, not these guys. They're going to be as loud as loud can be as they're going forward singing, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. When you get your eyes on God, when you keep your eyes on God, you're going to recognize that his mercy is made brand new every single morning. It never stops. It never lets up. You just go deeper and deeper into that mercy until the day that that mercy carries you all the way across into the the wonderful promised land that we have for us until you stand in the presence of the Lord. His mercy endures forever. And then as the priests begin to sing, as the worship leaders begin to lead in worship, as they declared the mercy of the Lord, how that endures forever, God set ambushes up in the enemy's camp. Nobody knows for sure exactly what this looked like. There are a lot of people that speculate. And some of these speculations, they sound like they make a really great movie. In some cases, it just says one guy got confused and accidentally killed somebody. And the next thing you know, they're all killing each other. Another theory is God had an angel go in and strike somebody down. And nobody could figure out who did it. And so they all began to gang up against each other. When you actually read the word ambush there, it's ambushes. It means there was more than one thing going on simultaneously. Whatever the problem is that you're up against, it might seem it's incredible. It might seem like you have no power over it. It might seem like you don't know what to do. But because you keep your eyes on God, he will cause multiple things to happen to change it all around so that you can step into God's mercy for today, tomorrow, and for every day to come. As they're praising and worshiping the Lord. God begins to move in the camp, and the next thing you know, they're all fighting against each other. And when Judah gets to the hill to look down into the valley, it's this incredible sight because all of their enemy is dead. All they have to do is go down and get the spoils. They're getting the spoils of victory from a battle they didn't have to fight. They're getting the spoils of the victory from people who were absolutely determined to destroy them. And there's so much when it comes to the spoils of the victory, it takes them three days to get it all out of the valley. They end up naming that valley the Valley of Baraka, the Valley of God's Blessing. And this is what I want you to take home more than anything else that I've said. When it seems like you're powerless, when it seems like you don't know what to do, if you keep your eyes on God, then the valley that should have been the valley of the shadow of death in your life, God will transform into a valley of blessing. Because you keep your eyes on God. 
On the fourth day, they had a great celebration. They, they celebrated all that God had done. Don't ever stop celebrating what God has done, is doing, and even go ahead and celebrate early what you know he's going to do. The next time that we see this valley in Scripture is prophetically as it's declared that there will be coming a judgment that will happen in this valley. It will no longer be referred to as the Valley of Baraka. It will be refu- referred to as the Valley of Judgment or literally the Valley of Jehoshaphat. God shall judge. The very same valley that your enemy wants to kill you in. The very same valley that God's going to turn into a blessing is going to ultimately become what you've been praying for in the first place. Where God is going to bring his vengeance to bear because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And I'm not even talking about how you might feel about your next door neighbor who screamed at you the other day. I'm not talking about that person when you were driving down the road and they cut you off. I'm talking about the enemy of every saint that has ever lived. The valley of Jehoshaphat, this valley of judgment. Satan himself knows that his days are numbered. And one day he will not be able to bother you or me or any saint ever Again, all we've got to do is keep our eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Will you stand with me this morning? If the musicians want to come. I have had probably three sermons since you asked me to speak that I've worked on for this morning. And every one that I've tried to work on ends up being, no, this is for somebody else. This isn't for this church. So when the Lord gave me this message, even though I know it's something the Lord is working on in my own life, you can just ask my wife. We had all kinds of conversations on the way here about a lot of the stuff that I've shared with you today. I don't know what area of your life that you feel powerless in. And I don't know what questions you have in the areas that you don't know what to do. But I know the one who has all the answers and I know the one who has all the power. And I believe that today, if you'll take a step of faith saying, God, I'm putting my eyes back on you, I believe that he's going to help you to overcome whatever the distractions are that are keeping you from being everything God wants you to be. I believe that God wants to turn that valley of the enemy into a valley of blessing. That valley that should even be a valley of your own judgment, I believe that he wants to turn it into a valley of blessing. But you've got to make sure you've got your eyes on him. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses that we need to run this race, right? With endurance. But we're supposed to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. So whatever it is that has taken your vision off of Jesus I want you to just bring it to the Lord today and lay it down at his feet and say, Lord, God, help me to keep my eyes on you. I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, I'm just going to invite those that would like to come and stand. I don't know how you usually end the service, but this is just how I feel led to do. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to invite you to come and stand. For those who'd like to stand, if you want to kneel, that's fine too. But if you're struggling with your powerlessness or you're struggling to know what to do, I want you to come as a step of faith saying, God, I'm going to put my eyes on you. Heavenly Father, right now in this place, I know, Lord God, that this word was for someone and not just myself, Lord. I believe this word was for someone in this place that you desire, Lord, to do an incredible work in someone's life. And that it begins in this moment, just like Jehoshaphat, when he feared and set himself to seek you. I believe that, Lord, it begins in this moment. So, Lord, I'm praying that in Jesus' name you give every person here who needs the courage, the courage that they need in order to be able to take those steps of faith 
and to pursue you, Lord God. In the midst of their powerlessness, in the midst of their uncertainty, to pursue you so that they can catch a fresh glimpse of who you are. In the powerful name above all names, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, I pray these things. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to take those steps of faith, I want to invite you to come and either stand in the front or find a place to pray. But if you would come and say, I've got an area that I'm powerless in or I've got an area that I need the Lord to show me what to do, I want to invite you to come and we're going to pray. sees you. He knows you. Yes, there are consequences for decisions and choices that you've made. But today you're saying, God, I don't have the power. I don't have the strength. I don't have the know-how. I don't know what to do. But I'm trusting that if I keep my eyes on you, you'll do what I cannot do. I'm going to let you fight my battles, God. I'm going to let you fight my battles. You stretch your hands and pray. If any of you feel led to come and pray with these, I encourage you to do that. Let's spend some time going after God. Just one. Two or three, I am your child. 